Hello and welcome back to 202 Decades of Western History. Last time, we talked about the inspiration, the purpose, and the structure of this series, and hopefully cleared up some questions. In short, I'll be covering Western history, whatever that is, from 1 AD to the present day, with one episode covering each decade, all 202 of them. This method will allow us to feel the beat and pace of history and hit the high points without getting too bogged down in the mundane. But first, let's lay some groundwork. If you don't care for a background or already have a grasp of the ancient world where our story starts, feel free to skip ahead to the main narrative. But if you want to follow the path of humanity from their origin to the first civilizations to the beginning of our story, Stay tuned. So now, let's go back. All the way back. We begin in Africa 300,000 years ago. At this time, several hominid species roamed the continent and beyond. We'll start with Homo erectus, a hominid species ancestral to modern humans, Neanderthals, and a third thing called Denisovans. Homo erectus had already spread from Spain in the west to Indonesia in the east by the time modern humans arose. In fact, Homo erectus first spread from Africa nearly two million years ago. Although more primitive than modern humans, Homo erectus were skilled hunters, capable of using stone tools to hunt buffalo and even elephant species. It's thought they were the first humans to use fire although whether they produced it or simply collected it from existing fires is still debated. Their long existence in various environments led to their diversification and speciation. In parts of Asia, they seemingly became the Denisovans. In Europe and the Middle East, Neanderthals. And in Africa, Homo sapiens. There may also have been an intermediate step called H. heidelbergensis, which was ancestral to both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. So, 300,000 years ago, anatomically modern humans existed. Physically, they would have looked quite human, but culturally, and probably intellectually, they were not modern, meaning they may not yet have had the capacity for abstract thinking, symbolic expression, or strategic planning. These things are the building blocks of language, art, religion, and culture. A few waves of these early Homo sapiens seem to have left Africa over 100,000 years ago, based on fossils in Greece and the Middle East, but these populations soon disappeared, seemingly being outcompeted by Neanderthals. Instead, the most recent evidence, genetic and archaeological, points to all modern humans with origins outside of Africa leaving Africa no earlier than 70 to 50,000 years ago. This migration likely coincided with cognitive developments which made these Homo sapiens truly modern humans. In theory, an infant Homo sapiens plucked from Africa 50,000 years ago would be perfectly functional and indistinguishable if brought to the present. Humans likely left Africa primarily through the Sinai Peninsula into the Middle East or by jumping from the Horn of Africa across the Red Sea into the Arabian Peninsula. From here, humans quickly spread across Asia and even reached Australia by no later than 42,000 years ago, around the same time modern humans entered Europe. When thinking of these migrations, go ahead and forget the world geography you're familiar with. Sea levels were much lower, due to huge ice caps concentrating water at the poles and in glaciers. It was an ice age. Thanks to these lower sea levels, a person could walk from Thailand to the islands of Borneo or Java, and nearby, the Australian continent was connected to Papua New Guinea in a great landmass called Sahul. Northern Europe was covered in ice sheets with tundra and frozen steppe south of that. Britain and Ireland were connected to the mainland in a landmass called Doggerland. This ice age is called the last glacial maximum 
which itself is the most recent in a series or cycle of glacial and interglacial periods, which began 2.5 million years ago. The last glacial maximum was about 22,000 years ago, and that last glacial period ended about 12,000 years ago. Since this last glacial maximum, sea levels have risen 130 meters, or over 420 feet. For comparison, the Statue of Liberty is only 305 feet tall. Humans took advantage of these lower sea levels everywhere, not only crossing the much shorter distance from what was then mainland Asia to the Sahul landmass, but also moving from Siberia to Alaska over the Bering Strait land bridge called Beringia, perhaps 14 to 20,000 years ago. In many parts of the world, these Homo sapiens sojourners did not find the lands empty. Archaic humans, the other descendants from Homo erectus, still survived across the world. In East and Southeast Asia, these were the Denisovans. In Europe and the Middle East, these were the Neanderthals. When modern humans entered new lands, conflict arose between the more inventive and lean Homo sapiens and the more robust but perhaps less adaptable archaics. Whether the conflicts were direct confrontation or a competition for resources, Homo sapiens came out on top. The archaic humans begin to disappear from the archaeological record soon after Homo sapiens show up. But, strangely enough, these archaics are not entirely gone. Modern Europeans, Native Americans, Aboriginal Australians, and Asians all have ancestry from either Neanderthals, Denisovans, or both. Interbreeding occurred. The percent of the genome is small, usually less than 2% of an individual's genes, but about 20% of the total Neanderthal genome has been found in Europeans and East Asians. Their legacy lives on with us. This earliest period of human prehistory, which ranged from proto-humans to the Homo sapiens expansion out of Africa to the end of the last glacial period, is called the Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age. It comprises a huge majority of human prehistory and is characterized by the use of larger stone tools along with bone and wood. As mentioned earlier, cognitively, modern humans did not arise until around 50,000 years ago. This 50,000 year marks the third and last phase of the Paleolithic, which ranged from 50,000 to around 12,000 years ago. During this time, humans were scarce on the earth. There were fewer than 30,000 people in all of Europe during the Paleolithic. They lived in small bands at this time, and without farming, large areas were needed to sustain even the small population. All peoples were transitory nomads, moving from place to place to follow game. Despite this, these people were capable of incredible art. In a cave in southern France, astonishingly lifelike drawings of animals have been found. At other sites, exquisite and stylized human-shaped ivory carvings have been found across Europe. The transition from Paleolithic to Mesolithic, that's the Middle Stone Age, took place in Europe with the end of the last Ice Age, about 12,000 years ago. This Middle Stone Age marks the culmination of hunter-gatherer lifestyles prior to agriculture or animal husbandry's development. Mesolithic people had advanced the technology of their Paleolithic predecessors in a number of ways. Their stone tools were generally smaller and more intricate and elegant. Mesolithic people also began to make and use early forms of pottery and textiles. Their food gathering methods had also shifted. Mass hunting of large animals was now less common. Instead, they employed broader strategies for food gathering. Permanent structures, absent from the Paleolithic, began to be constructed. These were most commonly along coastal areas and were likely used only seasonally. Without agriculture or livestock, areas are quickly depleted of food resources. The Mesolithic ends with the development of agriculture, 
But as we will see, the Mesolithic hunter-gatherer lifestyle continued in places unsuitable for agriculture throughout the Neolithic and up into recorded history. These original inhabitants of Europe form one of the three components of DNA of modern humans, the hunter-gatherers. These are broken down into further Western, Eastern, and Caucasus hunter-gatherers. The Neolithic, meaning the New Stone Age, began with the development of agriculture and animal husbandry. This process began in the Middle East, in the Fertile Crescent, that alluvial area of the Middle East curving from Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, and Syria, down the floodplains of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. The development of farming was not a sudden process, wherein a society went from being migratory hunter-gatherers to sedentary farmers in a generation. No, it seems to have been a much more gradual, step-by-step -step process. Wild grains had been collected and eaten for eons by Paleolithic and Mesolithic peoples. At some point, people may have begun to plant some of the grains they collected, untended and left alone, while the band leaves for a season, only to return and harvest. Over time, people began to select for grains with favorable qualities such as larger size and seeds that stayed on the plant longer before falling to the ground. This slow process of domestication rolled on for probably thousands of years. True agriculture began at the end of the last ice age in the Middle East. The process just mentioned had been in place here for millennia alongside other hunting and gathering. But the end of the Ice Age brought climatic shifts, which made other food resources more scarce. To survive, these people began to lean more and more heavily on harvested grain. A feedback loop started where more grain could be harvested when better tended and cared for, but this took time away from other hunting and gathering, so they had to rely more on their harvest grains, etc., over and over. Alongside this domestication of grain was the domestication of animals for livestock. First, wild boar were domesticated around 11,000 years ago, followed by sheep. And as a side note, dogs seem to have been domesticated at least twice as long, probably diverging from wolves over 30,000 years ago. By 10,000 years ago, wheat, barley, millet, and spelt were grown and sheep, goats, pigs, and cattle were herded. Agriculture began at first in the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East, but it's not the only place agriculture arose. Following the last ice age, agriculture arose in several places around the world. Next after the Middle East were the fertile valleys of the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers of China. Soon after, agriculture was developed in Papua New Guinea, followed by Central America, South America, and Sub-Saharan Africa, each location having its own collection of several crops. Lifestyles for these Neolithic people were now vastly different from their Mesolithic ancestors. They lived sedentary lives, spending their days working the fields. With stationary food sources came permanent dwellings, and populations and settlements grew throughout the Neolithic. Stone structures seem to have been built slightly before the transition to full-time agriculture. One such recently discovered site is Gobekli Tepe in eastern Turkey or Anatolia. It was a religious site which seems to have been built by hunter-gatherers or at least people who had not yet fully embraced agriculture. Nevertheless, with agriculture, stone structures became permanent and preeminent, and the first cities were constructed. Among the earliest cities in the world is Jericho, now in the Palestinian West Bank. Settlements seem to have begun by around 9000 BC, and the Neolithic population may have grown to 2,000 to 3,000 people. A 13-foot or 3-meter tall wall was constructed around the small, by today's standards, city. And by 8000 BC, a 26-foot or 8-meter tall stone wall was constructed. The development of cities led to increases in social stratification, and Jericho's wall and tower indicate a need for defense. But from whom? Other cities, or the hunter-gatherers who still roamed outside the city walls, are the most likely culprits.
warfare in a fashion recognizable to us may have begun during this time. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves. These cities were isolated islands of urbanism in a wide sea of hunter-gatherers. City-states may have begun to develop, but larger states were still far in the future. Agriculture led to surpluses of food. This, along with the stationary lifestyle, allowed an increase in the birth rate. Populations began to grow, and for a little while were sustained by the larger yields of a particular area in total calories offered by agriculture compared to hunting and gathering. But this growing population soon led to conflict, as Jericho's walls have shown us, and migration. These early farmers, seeking new lands not yet claimed by a settled people, began to migrate out of the Fertile Crescent. One group of farmers headed north and west and entered Anatolia, and by 6,500 BC, they had reached Greece and the Balkans. From here, it seems these early farmers split and went in two directions. The first keeping south along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, hopping over islands and reaching Spain and Morocco by 5,300 BC. The second group headed north from Greece into the Balkans, and then migrated up the Danube River corridor into Germany and France, reaching the North Sea by 5000 BC, and hopping over to Britain by 4000 BC. Together, these early farmers are called either Anatolian Neolithic farmers, or more commonly, Early European farmers, abbreviated EEFs. These early European farmers form the second group which contributed to modern European DNA. The first group were the hunter-gatherers. When the early European farmers migrated into Europe, the land wasn't empty. Western and Eastern hunter-gatherers were still thriving in their Mesolithic lifestyles. For us moderns, an agricultural lifestyle seems much more familiar to us and a safer bet when it comes to nutrition. But when these two groups encountered each other, it would have appeared the opposite. Hunter-gatherers would have been noticeably taller and more muscular than the farmers they met. And while farmers could sustain larger populations, they were less healthy and frequently suffered from diseases. The hunter-gatherers had the more rich and varied diet, but their resources could only sustain modest population sizes. When the early European farmers arrived, the archaeological record shows little interaction between the two groups. The farmers preferred open, inland areas with solid, fertile soil, while the hunter-gatherers preferred the woodlands, wetlands, and coastlines, where reliable plant and animal foods could be found. Because of their separate lifestyles, and perhaps some religious or cultural taboos, there was little intermixing or interbreeding between these two groups. One advantage the farmers had when it came to conflict was numbers. Both their stationary lives as well as their reliable food sources allowed them to have higher birth rates. They may not have been particularly strong or healthy individuals, but they were able to have children and keep them alive more successfully than the hunter-gatherers, and their food-producing methods allowed for a larger population in a given area. Their populations rose. So, when conflict did arise, the farmers had the population to either defeat the hunter-gatherers or to absorb defeats through greater numbers. Nevertheless, the two groups lived side by side for around 2,000 years, each maintaining their own way of life. Over the course of this time, though, early European farmers would have constituted a larger and larger proportion of the total population of the area. Then, about 4000 BC, the status quo crumbled. Although we don't know why, a sudden resurgence of hunter-gatherers occurred. Their share of the gene pool suddenly rises. The hunter-gatherer resurgence is particularly seen in the Y-DNA, the proportion of a genome that is exclusively passed down in male lineages. Female-specific DNA signatures, mtDNA or mitochondrial DNA, did not change significantly. This sudden increase in male-specific DNA is a good hint that the change was a violent one.
Most likely, the hunter-gatherers raided, conquered, and replaced the elites, heads, or leaders of the European farmers. With this resurgence, the two societies that had lived separate but side by side for so long began to meld together. One feature of this new hybrid culture is the proliferation of megalithic sites in Western Europe. A few had already dotted the landscape, but they became much more common after the resurgence. Around 3000 BC, a blast shot out from the European steppe. Arriving into our story is the third piece of modern European genetics, the Indo-Europeans. They probably originated in the steppe lands northeast of the Black Sea, in modern Russia and Ukraine, although there's continuing debate about this. They were a mobile people who raised cattle and horses, had few of any crops, and were nomadic, or at least semi-nomadic. The language you're listening to this in is descended from the Indo-Europeans, and if you are from Europe, the Americas, Iran, or northern India, your native language is likely Indo-European in origin. More than 3 billion people today speak an Indo-European language. So how did this small group of nomads come to dominate the world? The answer lies in their violent society, and in their early adoption of the wagon and bronze weapons, all of which aided their conquests. Over the course of the 3rd millennium BC, the climate of the steppe became colder and more inhospitable. So, the Indo-Europeans did what every steppe nomadic people does when they face harsh circumstances at home. They migrated. Over the next 2,000 years, waves of Indo-Europeans would leave the steppe and strike out across Europe, disrupting and destroying the farming communities in their tracks. If the hunter-gatherers' resurgence saw a small shift in population genetics, the arrival of the Indo-Europeans was a tectonic disruption in populations. Just like the hunter-gatherers, but to an even higher degree, the population change was particularly extreme among males. The Indo-Europeans brought about nearly total male replacement in their migrations. Bands of young Indo-European men would raid into unsuspecting farming communities, killing the men, gathering up food, livestock, or valuables, and capturing or raping the women. Sometimes it was more than raids, though. They would kill the leaders of the farming communities and place themselves at the head of society. It would have been one horrible time to be a farmer. By becoming the elites in every land they conquered, the population under their rule began to speak their languages. Latin, Greek, German, Celtic, Hindi, Russian, and Farsi all share their origins in the migrations of the Indo-Europeans. A few places in Europe survived the migrations, whether due to isolation, like the Mediterranean island of Sardinia, which today has the highest proportion of early European farmer ancestry in Europe, or by living in a society sophisticated enough to withstand the invasion, such as the Minoans of Greece. But we've been too focused on Europe during this episode. Now that we've reached the Minoans, we need to take a step back and look at their predecessors in Mesopotamia and Egypt. The last time we looked at the Fertile Crescent was when the first farmers took their agricultural technology and began to migrate into Europe. But the farmers who were left behind were not stagnant. In these fertile lands, societies became increasingly complex and true civilization took root. Cities grew larger, surplus crops allowed specialization, and the first priests, artisans, and kings emerged. In Egypt, the climate began to change following the end of the last ice age. The Sahara, which for millennia had been a fertile grassland, began to become desert. The nomadic animal herders who had made their homes in the green Sahara migrated to escape the spreading sands. Many of these refugees gathered around the fertile land along the Nile River. Soon these pastoralists shift to farming as agriculture reached them from the Fertile Crescent. Initially many small states existed along the Nile, but soon they were consolidated into two substantial kingdoms, somewhat confusingly called the Upper Kingdom in the south and the Lower Kingdom in the north, 
This naming is because the Nile flows downhill from south to north. So the Southlands are up higher altitude-wise than the Northlands. Around 3000 BC, the king of the Upper Kingdom conquered the Lower Kingdom and united all of Egypt under one pharaoh, Pharaoh Menes, or Narmer. Thus began the first dynasty of the Old Kingdom of Egypt. At the time of the unification of Egypt, back in the Mesopotamian Fertile Crescent, civilization was already old. Cities began appearing in the north of Mesopotamia around the same time as Jericho was established in the Levant, roughly 7000 BC. But cities and civilization creeped south into the wetter, swampier lands of the delta of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. Farming here required new irrigation techniques. By about 5400 BC, the first city in the south was established, Eridu. Today's site of Eridu is far from the waters of the Persian Gulf, but in its heyday the city sat near the shore of the Gulf. In the 7,000 plus years since then, the fertile silt from those two rivers extended the land into the Gulf. It's time to introduce the Sumerians, the first people of true history. All predecessors of the Sumerians belong in prehistory. What distinguishes these categories? Writing or written records. Who invented writing first? The Sumerians. But who were the Sumerian people? Our answer is only a best guess. They stand out from other peoples of the Near East, which then and today is dominated by people speaking Semitic languages. Think the ancestors of Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, Akkadian, and Syriac. Some think the Sumerian language is descended from those early farmers who we followed into Europe, but who also spread across the Near East. Others suspect they were migrants from North Africa who were fleeing the desertification of the Sahara. But others, and I think I land here, believe the Sumerian language originates in the hunters and fishers of southern Mesopotamia. They were also refugees. While a minute ago I mentioned that land has extended into the Persian Gulf over the past several millennia, the opposite is also true. With the end of the Ice Age came the melting of much of that ice. The same sea level rise that cut off Asia from North America and Australia from New Guinea and Great Britain from mainland Europe also flooded much of the fertile valley which now lies at the bottom of the Persian Gulf. What mysteries must lie hidden at the bottom of those waters? Regardless, although the Sumerians were a unique people for their region, they were not the first people to live in the area. We know they weren't the ones who built the first cities or drained the marshes or built the canals and irrigation. And I should say that there wasn't one Sumerian kingdom, but several Sumerian city-states, some with names you may know, such as Uruk and Ur. What sets these people apart from all their predecessors is that they were the first people in all the world that we know of to record their lives in writing. Around 3500 BC, someone had the idea to record information symbolically. Taking their fingernail or a stick, he or she etched a picture on some wet clay to record something. At first, the symbols were purely pictorial. The symbol for a fish looked like a fish, and the one for an ox looked like an ox. Over the next few hundred years, as the idea caught on and spread among traders and tax collectors, symbols were increasingly simplified. For example, that fish became two curved lines that intersected at the tail. By 2900 BC, the Sumerian scribes had begun to use a wedge-tipped stylus to make the symbols. Not long after the development of writing in Sumeria, Egypt developed its own writing system. It's still debated whether the Egyptians developed their own system independently or borrowed the idea from their Sumerian neighbors. Today we take writing and literacy for granted, but there was once a backlash against the newfangled technology. Some thought it was corrupting the skills and morals of the youth. The historian Will Durant, in his discussion on the origins of writing, relates an Egyptian legend. When the god Thoth revealed his discovery of the art of writing to King Thamos, the good king denounced it as an enemy of civilization. Children and young people, protested the monarch, 
who had hitherto been forced to apply themselves diligently to learn and retain whatever was taught them, would cease to apply themselves and would neglect to exercise their memories. Whether they were degenerates or innovators, the first scribes and record keepers were the ones who allowed us to peer into the lives of the past. Their work made history and history podcasts possible. No doubt that first writer had this very podcast in mind when he or she scratched the first symbol into the clay. And that's where we will leave things today, now that we've covered all of human prehistory. Next time, we jump from prehistory to history and cover all of history from the invention of writing to the classical age of Greece. The Decades Narrative is coming soon after. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, I would be extremely grateful if you left a rating on iTunes. See you next time.